Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Tomorrow's Children, edited by Isaac Asimov. So this is a short story anthology with a bunch of different authors. Dane reads. I'm going to read you the blurb from the back cover, then I'm going to go through and check out the contents list for you. Then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Tommy Loy, a cabin boy trapped in a preternatural situation in outer space. Star Holmes, an accomplished time traveller at the age of five. Anthony Fremont, a small boy cast in the role of Satan. Charles Walton, a child in mortal and horrifying combat with his father. Tomorrow's Children, 18 haunting tales of children in time to come, when the fantastic has become the commonplace, when witchcraft is a science and creatures from alien planets live next door. Stories by the masters of fantasy and science fiction, Ray Bradbury, Damon Knight, Clifford D. Simak, Stephen Vincent Bennett, Fritz Leiber, Robert A. Heinlein and Isaac Asimov. Uh, let's see who's in this. 18 Tales, illustrations by Emmanuel Shonga. They're not very good to be honest, but I mean, it, this isn't like the best quality paper or anything. It's very pulp. So, you know, I don't think he had much choice. He had to do very simple illustrations for it to work, you know. So we have an introduction, No Life of Their Own by Clifford D. Simak, The Accountant by Robert Sheckley, Novice by James H. Schmitz, Child of Void by Margaret St. Clair, when the Bow Breaks by Lewis Paget, A Pale of Air by Fritz Leiber, Junior Achievement by William Lee, Cabin Boy by Damon Knight, The Little Terror by Will F. Jenkins, Gilead by Zena Henderson, The Menace from Earth by Robert A. Heinlein, The Wayward Cravat by Gertrude Friedberg, The Father Thing by Philip K. Dick, Star Bright by Mark Clifton, All Summer in a Day by Ray Bradbury, It's a Good Life by Jerome Bixby, The Place of the Gods by Stephen Vincent Bernay, and The Ugly Little Boy by Isaac Asimov. So I want to read from the introduction here. He says, Science fiction and fantasy serve many purposes and surely one of them is to stave off age. This branch of literature is particularly associated with youth. One only has to attend a national convention of science fiction fans to see that. There are not as many youngsters trailing the big name writers as Haunt the Beatles perhaps, but the science fiction fans make up in polysyllabic speech what they lack in decibelic screech. And uh, he has another dig at the Beatles later, which I tabbed out. Uh, bear in mind this was writ uh, written in like 1965. It was actually published or first published in the UK in the 70s after the Beatles disbanded. But I just can't help wondering what he would have made of WAP, you know? So in No Life of Their Own, this is the one by, uh, handily it doesn't say the author, Clifford D. Simak. Um, and he's talking about a Libet set. It's a viewer that you clamp onto your head and you look into it and you pick your channel and turn it on, then settle back and live the things you see. You mean, it's a VR headset? Cool. Okay, then we have The Accountant by Robert Sheckley. And this is about a guy whose parents wanted to be a wizard and he wants to be an accountant, so. I'm gonna be an accountant, he said. We'll see, Mr. D shouted, all patience gone. You will not be an accountant, young man. You will be a wizard. It was good enough for the rest of your family and by all that's damnable, it'll be good enough for you. You haven't heard the last of this, young man. And what's great is that they basically summon this demon and this demon's like, oh yeah, an accountant, he's doing the devil's work, good stuff. Oh, th this introduction here for Novice by James H. Schmitz. Uh, again, Asimov does these great introductory essays in his own anthology, so it's cool to see him here writing introductions for other people's pieces. Um, and this has just got him not putting up with people's bullshit. One day recently, I was engaged in one of my favorite early morning occupations, that of staring in the mirror at my hair and wondering if I was getting gray enough to notice. As usual, I decided that I wasn't. I was still holding up, yes sir. With a certain satisfaction I thought of an old far away friend whom I hadn't seen in years and who, when I last had seen him, at a time when he was considerably younger than I am now, was all grey. How delightful! That night the old friend called. He was passing through Boston and had arrived in fact that morning at just about the time that I was thinking of him. I told him so and he said inevitably, telepathy! And like the dull old conservative I am, I said, no, coincidence! Do you know how many times I think of old far away friends who have then don't call me? But such rational arguments are useless. Everyone wants to believe in telepathy and seizes on every pretext to do so. Why this should be, I don't know. Consider the trouble we get into by talking. Even though every one of us is remarkably adept at weasel words and outright lies, still, if we talk long enough, we convict ourselves every time. Think of the deadly nature of the newspaper interview in which someone is quoted correctly. Why then should anyone want to communicate by thought when the chances of control are less and the chances of disaster infinitely greater? But mind reading is fun to play with in science fiction, at least. So let James H. Schmitz introduce you to a young lady who is involved with both mind reading and extraterrestrials to produce the combination he calls xenotelepathy. Unfortunately, I didn't tap anything else out in that story. 
Again, another. You can see that I'm an Asimov fan, can't you? Because the next thing here is Child of Void by Margaret Sinclair. And again, I tabbed out the intro essay that I want to read here. A perennial source of discomfort to me is the confusion in the minds of part of the public about science fiction fans and flying saucer enthusiasts. To be sure, flying saucer enthusiasts like to present their unidentified flying objects as spaceships from other worlds manned by individuals of advanced technologies. And surely this sounds like science fiction. Incidentally, these people are not the least interested in unidentified flying objects and are furious with scientists who wish to leave them unidentified until more information is in. No, no, these enthusiasts instantly identify every such object in full and foolish detail. But consider the differences. The flying saucer enthusiast often postulates creatures that are humanoid in form, are dressed in robes, are benign of purpose, and are constantly speaking like storybook preachers. Doesn't this sound familiar? Are we not in a kind of pseudo-scientific spirit world, one that has dropped the ectoplasm and higher planes of the earlier spiritualists, to take up the mysterious space drives and other planets of a new breed of mystic? What has that sort of nonsense to do with real science fiction? Science fiction is man-centred rather than spirit-centred. Man's problems must be solved or not solved by man, and there are no creatures, whether spirits or road benignites from Venus, to take care of us. If creatures from outer space do reach us, they are very apt to add to our problems and pose new crises. Let Margaret Sinclair introduce a youngster who finds himself in the midst of just such a problem and see how he and his family handle it. Or do they? So this kid's basically decided he's gonna, he's gonna top himself, so we get the dynamite was in a box in the shed. I hunted around until I found the detonator and the fuse. I stuffed the waxy candle-like sticks inside the waistband of my trousers and picked up the other things. I was going to kill myself, but part of me felt a certain compunction at the thought of blowing up Mum and Dommy. I went outside and began to walk uphill. The sun was coming up in a blaze of red and gold and there was a soft little breeze. I could smell wood smoke a long way off. It was going to be a fine day. I looked around me critically for a good place to blow myself up. They say suicides are often very particular. I know I was. This spot was too open and that one too enclosed. There was too much grass here and not quite enough at the other place. It wasn't that I had cold feet, I hadn't. But I wanted everything to go off smoothly and well, without any hitches or fuss. I kept wandering around and looking and pretty soon, without realising it, I was near the hillside with the cave. So we're going to move on to When the Bow Breaks here. This is the one by Lewis Paget. A lot of these authors are new to me. And this is basically about a super child, so this baby... Uh, yeah, Alexander was vomiting with the air of a research man absorbed in a fascinating phenomenon. Alexander, Myra cried. Darling, are you sick? No, Alexander said. I'm testing my regurgitative process. I must learn to control my digestive organs. Calder and leaned against the door, grinning crookedly. Yeah, you'd better start now, too. We get this because the kid likes riddles and it says, uh, What goes up a chimney up was treated with the contempt it deserved. Alexander examined his father's riddles, turned them over in his logical mind, analysed them for flaws in semantics and logic, and rejected them. Or else he answered them with such fine accuracy that Calderon was too embarrassed to give the correct answers. He was reduced to what he was reduced to asking why a raven was like a writing desk, and since not even the Mad Hatter had been able to answer his own riddle, was slightly terrified to find himself listening to a dissertation on comparative ornithology. Well, a raven's like a writing desk because Poe wrote on both. And then uh, Myra goes, like all babies, he's antisocial. Yeah, uh, really interesting little passage here. Humour is a developed sense, stemming basically from cruelty. The more primitive a mind, the less selectivity exists. A cannibal would probably be profoundly amused by the squirmings of his victim in the seething kettle. A man slips on a banana peel and breaks his back. The adult stops laughing at that point, the child does not. And a civilised ego finds embarrassment as acutely distressing as physical pain. A baby, a child, a moron is incapable of practising empathy. He cannot identify himself with another individual. He is regrettably autistic, his own rules are arbitrary, and garbage strewn around the bedroom is funny to neither Myra nor Calderon. So here we have A Pail of Air, and uh, this is by Fritz Leiber, and again I've tabbed out the introduction here. This is quite a telling story about Asimov himself. Those of us in the Northeast aren't going to forget the gigantic power failure of November 9th, 1965. The lights in my house went out just as dinner was about to be served. We calmly lit a number of candles and ate. The children didn't mind since anything novel was rather exciting and they relied in full security on their parents' protection. My wife, having managed to finish the cooking before the blackout and feeling rich in candles, wasn't worried either. Only I grew uneasy. After all, I have an electric typewriter and the thought that I was in no position to write in case the mood came upon me, as it does almost constantly, set my fingers to twitching helplessly. My son, in a gesture of touching loyalty, offered me his non-electric typewriter and a candle, but that would scarcely do. So I called Boston Edison and the line was busy. My next step was to go down to the garage and turn on one of the car radios. 
We had no transistor radios that night. We now have three. The first thing I heard was the astonishing phrase, blackout all over New England and New York. I raced upstairs, put out all the candles but one, placed the flashlights out of reach, and sternly announced that I was instituting strict rationing. I've been immersed in science fiction catastrophes for too many years to take such matters lightly. Of course, the current went on a few hours later, and my family has never forgiven me for making a military emergency out of what might have been a lark. But here is one of the stories that influenced me on that occasion. Let the tall and handsome Fritz Leiber, son of the Shakespearean actor and looking at every inch, describe a youngster facing the results of an almost ultimate catastrophe and doing so with a resilience that fills one with hope for the human race. So on to junior achievement with William Lee. And this is where he has a go at the Beatles again. Now I'm a big Beatles fan, but I'm a big Asimov fan as well, but I thought it was interesting still. The teenager is king these days, I am told. As controller of a sizeable fraction of the nation's spending money, he must be catered to by those who put out movies, television shows and musical recordings. The rest of us must endure it all. And yet teenage enthusiasms are not actually murderous. Listening to the Beatles may make you wish you were dead if you were over 19, but you don't really die however much your hair turns grey. And if you listen to them long enough you may even find a perverted liking for them growing within you. I have, to my own horror, been seduced into listening to them and then found myself singing some of their songs with every sensation of pleasure. And teenage accomplishment can be admirable too. At the age of 18, the English chemist William Henry Perkin prepared the first synthetic dye, recognised what he had, quit school, opened a factory, single-handedly designed the necessary equipment, refined the necessary chemicals and founded a giant industry. He retired at 35, a millionaire many times over. The American chemist Charles Martin Hall, having heard that the man who first worked out a practical method for producing aluminium cheaply would make himself a millionaire, went home, worked out such a method and became filthy rich. Of course, he wasn't quite a teenager, just an old man of 22. So let William Lee introduce you to a number of kids in an upbeat, non beetle view of what kids might be like. And this is about, like, little, little kitty Elon Musk. And this is some of the ideas they come up with. Tommy, for example, wanted to put tooth powder into tablets that one could chew before brushing the teeth. He thought there should be two colours in the same bottle, orange for morning and blue for night. The blue one's designed to leave the mouth alkaline at bedtime. Pete wanted to make a combination nail and wood screw. You drive it in with a hammer up to the threaded part, then send it home with a few turns of a screwdriver. That actually sounds really useful. Hillary, reluctantly forsaking his ideas on detergents, suggested we make black plastic discs like poker chips but thinner and as cheap as possible to scatter on a snowy sidewalk where they would pick up extra heat from the sun and melt the snow more rapidly. Afterwards, one would sweep up and collect the discs. Doris added to this that if you can make the discs light enough to float, they might be coloured white and spread on the surface of a reservoir to reduce evaporation. Very clever kids. So on to Cabin Boy by Damon Knight. This is just some great characterization. That was, if not Francis's most exasperating trick, at least high on the list. She had a habit of introducing your own arguments as if it were not only a telling point on her side, but something you had been too dense to see. Arguing with her was like swinging at someone who abruptly disappeared and then sandbagged you from behind. We get this kind of irritating line, uh, mostly mother had laughing eyes. She was the laughingest mother in Socorro. To be fair, this is being told by a child so you can forgive them for using the word laughingest, but still. Okay, moving on to The Menace from Earth by Robert A. Heinlein. And in this we get the line, uh, I had hay fever. Probably you've never heard of hay fever. You don't die, but you wish you could. It's about right. Okay, so moving on to The Father Thing by Philip K. Dick, and this is almost uh, flat-out horror, I quite enjoyed it. So I'm going to read you this introduction here again, because uh, again, it's the introductions I tend to like the most. I've got one more introduction I want to read as well. There is a charming story told of King Frederick William I of Prussia, 1713 to 1740. A gross, boorish, penny-pinching individual who felt himself to be the father of his people and expected to be regarded as such. He had the habit of walking the streets of Berlin with a stout cudgel and using said cudgel as an instrument of correction if he saw anything of which he disapproved. Naturally, the citizenry sought business elsewhere when they spied his stout figure on the horizon. Frederick William, annoyed at the growing emptiness of the streets, snatched at a wizened individual one day as he was about to worm his way down an alley. Why are you hastening away? demanded Frederick William. Please, sire, said the trembling man, I fear you. Fear me? cried the outraged monarch. You're supposed to love me. And lifting his cudgel high, he chased the unfortunate down the street, laying on vigorously and yelling, love me, scum, love me. And how many ordinary fathers do the same? How many of them are wound up springs of vengeance and punishment who, after unwinding, having expended their aggressions on a person forbidden to strike back or even to defend himself, sit back and expect love? If it weren't that children could look forward to having children of their own someday, there might be more parasites. I thought it was patricides. 
It is the glory of science fiction that even the oldest of emotions, such as the imperfectly repressed feelings of aggression a child feels against the all-powerful father, can be given a fresh and sometimes frightful cast. Let Philip K. Dick bring you the description of a child in mortal and horrifying combat with, after a fashion, his father. And as, as it's called, the father thing. Uh, basically, the idea behind this story is that um, basically like aliens are taking control of bodies and stuff. A bit like in Men in Black. Okay, so here we have The Ugly Little Boy by Isaac Asimov, and I want to read you his introduction here. It doesn't make him come off as the nicest guy, it makes him come across as quite big-headed, to be honest, but hey-ho. Sometimes, when I'm feeling a little uncertain, I wonder if it isn't immodest for an editor of an anthology to include one of his own stories. And it is, it is. But I guess I'd better adjust myself to my own immodesty, for I'm not only including this story, but I'm saying right now that I like it better than any other story in the collection. After all, isn't it more important for me to be honest than modest? As a matter of fact, a writer is necessarily immodest, or he couldn't possibly be a writer. What on earth can convince a person that anyone would not only be willing to read the words he has committed to paper, but would actually pay money for the privilege? Only an enormous and overwhelming immodesty. I had spent half a dozen years of youth writing without ever daring to let anyone see the product of my muse but myself. There's modesty for you, it leads to nothing. Then at 18, something snapped within me and immodesty burgeoned into immediate full bloom. I gathered together the story I had just written and brought it to an editor, expecting, well not really expecting, but hoping, that he would pay me a bright shiny copper penny for every single glorious word I had written, even including little ones like the and of and ah. He didn't. He sent the story back to me the very next day, but with such a kind letter that I was thereafter permanently frozen into immodesty. From the day of that rejection forward, I have made a career of offering to sell my words. Only it's been a long time since I charge a mere penny for one of them. Anyway, let me introduce you to an ugly little boy. I charge 5.5 cents for my words. And uh, this has got a lot of reference to stasis, which is cool because I'm a Red Dwarf fan, and stasis is quite an important thing in that as well. Stasis being like this period outside of time, effectively. So yeah, Tomorrow's Children, edited by Isaac Asimov. It was probably a, a pretty strong 3.5 out of 5. As with any short story collection, there were some I enjoyed more than others. Some of them I absolutely hated and just read just to get to the end of them. Others I loved and thought that the, just the concept in the stories alone was worth reading the entire book. So yeah, I would recommend it, especially if you're a sci-fi fan. So there we have it, that's what I made of Tomorrow's Children by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.